Okay, so up next, we'll sit down with the Department of Health and Human Services to discuss how they're modernizing legacy applications and implementing a seamless zero trust security strategy to combat challenges. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Ben DeBont, Chief Information Security Officer at ServiceNow, and Gerald Caron, Chief Information Officer and Assistant Inspector General of Information Technology within the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General. Thank you, Steve, and thank you to all of you, our wonderful IT partners, for taking the time to listen in today on this lightning chat, an extremely complex and fascinating topic that is Zero Trust. So Jerry, before we rack your brains on Zero Trust, would you mind sharing a little bit more about your current role at HHS? Yeah, certainly. Uh, great to see humans uh, in person for once. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, but yes, I'm the Chief Information Officer at the Department of Health and Human Services, Office of the Inspector General. Uh, basically and responsible for all IT that supports the Inspector General's mission um, of fraud, waste and abuse, Medicaid, Medicare fraud, all those great things that healthcare provides. So um, support that mission of the auditors, the investigators, the litigators in doing that and bringing them the best IT possible so that they can be successful. Thanks, Jerry. So if we were at a, uh, a security conference, and there's been many security conferences where there's been sessions on Zero's Trust, thousands of them, I have, uh, I'm confident that I could walk up to anyone in the audience, and if I asked them their opinion on what Zero Trust is, I would get a different answer. I would get a different response on what the value is that it provides, and also a different response on how to execute against it, or implement it, or deploy it. So Jerry, what does Zero Trust mean to you? means by employment, uh, <laughs> keeps me busy. <laughs> uh, but no, zero trust is, is bit very important to me. Um, I, I'm an evangelist, um, educator, I like to say around zero trust, been doing it for, for years. But to me, if I had to say, what does it mean to me? At the end of the day, you gotta think about what it is that you're protecting and you're trying to protect the data. Um, a lot of people will argue with me, it's about the identity. Well, yes, identity is very important, but I would challenge that with, if it was about the identity and you got compromised, what's the first thing the cyber analyst is gonna ask? What did you have access to? And is, is there exfil, right? So what does it become about? Becomes about the data again. So basically understanding your data, what is your data? And when you do talk about the identity, right data to the right people at the right time, and make sure that that data has the integrity, something that they can trust, because that's what we make our everyday decisions on. What facilitates access to that data? It's applications. Applications sits on devices, and devices uh, communicate through networks. So moving back, kind of like the OSI model, moving back, how do I protect around data? What are the concepts around that? How, what facilitates the access to that data? Concepts around applications, then devices, network, and then the identity. Um, and there's different identities. Uh, we're all one human. So we need to be able to understand all those different identities that are tied to that human, as well as the different levels of those identities, admins, users, power users, things like that. So Jerry, in cybersecurity, uh, it is a field where there's new vulnerabilities, old vulnerabilities, breaches every day. You read about it in the news, and this has been ongoing year after year for decades. And as technology becomes more pervasive in our lives, the attack surface that an attacker can exploit continues to grow. So I very much feel that it is very difficult to defend and in many ways trivial to attack. Given what you said about data, securing data isn't a new concept. How does applying zero trust help protect ourselves from attack? So first of all, zero trust is not one tool or one solution. It is an architecture made up of a bunch of concepts that, you gotta, that have to work together in conjunction. Uh, there's many factors that you have to constantly ex assess. Um, the types of users, how did they proof themselves? What is my risk level for that proofing? Like username and password is gonna be uh, more risky than a PIV card, for example, or a CAT card. Um, taking those factors into um, consideration and doing it in real time. I like to use, um, we gotta get away from, uh, you know, everybody says the castle mo, I say the Tootsie Roll Pop, right? We know Mr. Al bit, licked the Tootsie Roll Pop three times and then he broke security by using his beak to get through on the third lick. Um, so, you know, and then get to that soft, gooey center. 
we can't do that. We, we have to move our control, not our controls. I don't want to say controls um, necessarily because we want to move forward effectiveness and control is kind of more towards compliance and, and the federal government, of course. But we want to move things closer to the data and the things that we're predicting. You know, the cafeteria schedule versus your medical records. Um, I want to make sure the cafeteria schedule gets compromised. I can assure you that your medical records are still protected. So getting away from this big boundary and having that soft GUI center like we had before, but moving those boundaries in, those concepts, even segmenting within databases and things like that. I like to use the movie theater scenario. I know I go to the multiplex movie theater because I start to go into the movies again. And where do they scan my ticket? They scan my ticket at the lobby. Well, in Zero Trust, they should be scanning my ticket at each movie door because I bought a ticket to go see the regular, but hey, the IMAX is going in five minutes. I'm just going to slip in there. Well, there's no ticket taker at that door, and there's no ushers coming to check. Am I in the right seat? Is the camera working? Are the lights down? Is everybody in the right seat? Are in the, the movies? You've got to constantly check. So that's like ongoing authentication, ongoing access. And there's a bunch of factors that you have to constantly check. And, uh, and listening to the general before is like, we got to do this in real time, right? We can't wait on humans to identify, hey, something's wrong there. Let me try to figure that out. And zero trust has got to be automated. It's got to all work together. All those factors from all those tools have to come about so that you can, whoa. <laughs> I'll start over. <laughs> um, so you got to take and measure all these factors. So we could talk about technology a lot, but I think some people miss the conversation of the methodology and understanding the risk and what your risk tolerances are. You have to build those different risk tolerances based off those factors so that if it reaches a factor, let's say um, something gets triggered, you had full access, but something happened, I'm not really sure, I may downgrade you to, you can read only, but I'm not gonna let you download a print. Or I may, if I have the ability, block you or quarantine you and if I have control, like an MDM, I can bring you back into compliance. If I don't, which is a higher risk, I may just block you completely. So we could go on forever. <laughs> yeah. But, but Jerry, um, you mentioned that the movie theater example by yes. having your ticket scanned multiple times. I admit that back in Australia, I might have seen an extra movie uh, when I only had a ticket for one in the past when yes. I was a kid. But doing that multiple scanning, and you did say it needs to be automated, that type of approach, that's easier said than done. How is it practical for an agency to go ahead and automate authentication so that you don't trust anything, but you do constantly verify in a way that doesn't slow you down? Well, I'm going to back up a little bit. First is understanding what your data, the data is. And um, one of the things that we're going to be doing is going to identify a data source, and we're going to understand the baseline of where that data is going. Where is it, where is it flowing? I'm not doing network mapping. That's different. I'm talking about data mapping taking an application and mapping the data. Where is it hooking? Where is it talking to? Where is that data flowing? I got to know what normal looks like mm -hmm. before I can say what is abnormal. Um, so really got to understand that baseline. In reference to what you're talking about in the authentication aspects, it's got to be an ongoing authentication and an ongoing access. I, I need to check these factors. Um, there's things like in the cloud, you know, taking advantage of the cloud, conditional access policies, mm -hmm. impossible travel. You are in DC, but you're in Australia, and five minutes later, mm -hmm. I got to do something, right? So I can't just do this linearly one time through the door, have a nice day. I, I have to constantly keep checking. Now, you ask about like the user and, and alluding to like the performance of a user and how do I how do I maintain that? Well, I am employing my users as part of my zero trust team early on. I, I'm educating them. Hey, we're going to be talking about this zero trust thing. They're not IT people, so hey, there's, you're going to hear about this zero trust thing. Things might change, okay, um, over the next few years. But you know what? I need to know how you want to work. Why? Because I want to incorporate that into my requirements. So I can make zero trust seamless. And I'm also talking to them about what are the benefits? Single sign-on, uh, better, you know, and, and pretty much more transparent. It can be doing be in the background. It doesn't have to be put in a pin every five minutes. So I can trust that you're still there and who you are. Um, but just keep checking these factors and, and being seamless. But understand how they work and how, well, not how they work, how they want to work. Where's the data they're accessing? How are they accessing it? And, and, and how are they authenticating? What devices are they using? What data is important to them? And how are they making decisions? And building that in because that's going to help 
the adoption. So I, I, I equate it to the playbook of a football team, right? You got the people on the field, they're the ones that are gonna implement my zero trust. I got the sideline, those are the ones that are my project managers, program managers. I got the executive suite, you know, the CFOs, making sure we get the resources, the agency head that's prioritizing, making sure that it's important that we do it. But well, who am I doing it for? Like I said at the beginning, I am doing it. HHSOIG was not put on this earth to do IT. IT is the enabler of HHSOIG's mission. They're the fans, and I want to make sure that my fans are happy. So I want to make sure that I incorporate their requirements as I go through this journey of zero trust and let them know the benefits that they're going to gain um, as I do that. Seamless single sign-on kind of things and things like that. Um, not tethering them back to a um, on-premises network just to go back out to the cloud where we're pretty much modernizing a lot of our legacy applications as well. So, so long answer to a short question. No, it's a, it's a great answer, <laughs> Jerry. Um, I was just thinking, so now that the last year's executive order mandates a pr uh, embracing a, a zero trust approach, has there been um, like additional resources allocated to achieve this, or is it expected to be achieved by existing resources and uh, maybe to expand that a little bit further, there are so many security, cybersecurity requirements already in place. How does, how does an agency even wrap their head around what they need to achieve in addition to maintaining, or at least still trying to meet the status quo for existing requirements? Yeah, um, yeah, a lot to unpack there. But um, definitely, the EO, I what I like about the EO, it doesn't make it just an IT thing. It's, it's, it's now an agency thing. The agency has to understand that this is important. We have to in improve the nation's cybersecurity. So everybody pay attention to this, not just the IT people. Um, as far as um, funding and things like that and resources, um, there is uh, OMB memo 22-09 um, that came out um, a little over a month ago. And that pretty much says first year, um, you know, find out a way to pay for some things. Um, but start budgeting in, because we do two-year budget cycles, but are budgeting in into, for 2024. Um, but also, you know, a great resource, and some, some agencies have been successful in going through the process, and I've actually submitted through the process, there's a technology modernization fund. Um, that was some money set aside for the president to help with some of these modernization efforts, not just zero trust. Um, a few uh, agencies have gotten that, um, you know, submitted for that and, and getting that money. Um, to the other part of your question about where to start, you know, we're all in different places and we're all in different levels of maturity. Um, you know, I kind of say the three, the pillars, um, if they line up with DHS's pillars or not, um, but you know, basically they will in some form or fashion. You know, I talked about data, um, I talked about you know, applications, devices, networks, users, um, things like that. What I did is I have a zero trust capabil functional capabilities model. And if you're a vendor and you want to talk to me about zero trust, you have a homework assignment, and this would be your homework assignment. Under, uh, under all of these columns, I have functional capabilities. What I did internally is, even if it's a security tool or not, what are all the technologies that I have at my fingertips without making another investment? And then taking DHS's maturity model, how well am I doing in that? I may not be doing it. Okay, that's red. Um, I may be doing it. I'm doing very well according to the maturity model. That's green. Okay, don't have to worry about that one so much. Vendors also get that, because no vendor, one vendor does everything. So I ask them, what functions do you cover? Um, so even the ones I invested in, um, you know, I gave them also. I said, look, I have an investment. If I didn't spend another penny for another license, what could I do in Zero Trust and, you know, provided that. So definitely doing that inventory so I know what I can take advantage of with the concepts of Zero Trust. And then I understand where my gaps are, where I have to mature and where my gaps are. And next what we're doing is um, I have five foundational projects and we're putting together our roadmap um, for the next few years. What does our phase one look like? What, where do we want to be after phase one, phase two, phase three, and onward? And of course with M22-09, um, there are some things that we have to specifically do. So where do those fit into my roadmap as well? Because those are definite things that I have to do because uh, OMB is telling us to do it, but still it doesn't cover all of Zero Trust, so that roadmap is going to be very important. But doing that inventory up front, understanding what your capabilities possibly are, because I'm a non-for-profit, um, you know, I have to deal with the budget I have, but I want to make the most of my investments, so that's why I do that inventory first and foremost. That was one of my first things. Is that, um, Jerry, is that phased approach going to meet 
expectations around timeline for HHS? That's a good question um, because I'll, that will be kind of a TBD until I kind of get a little bit more. I got to kind of uncover some of the maturity. It's kind of a self-assessment, but you know, it's like peeling back an onion. There's so much to this. There's so much integration that we need to do. But you know, my thing is, and I tell people is like, and I, I said this the other day in one of my meetings, if I take one step forward, that's better than taking no steps at all. Um, so if I can get 10% forward, I'm, I'm making progress. Um, like I said, we're all gonna be in, we're not get, it's not gonna be a one size fits all, we're not all gonna look the same at the end, but we have to go back to what are the true concepts when John Kindervad came up with this, um, when he worked at Forrester, who is the grandfather of Zero Trust, um, go back to those concepts, just like I always reference back to the OSI model still, you know? It's, it's kind of going back to that Zero Trust 101. What am I trying to accomplish at the end of the day? Why am I doing this? And understanding that. Um, you can get kind of diluted with the, with the, the technology and the, the, you know, the buzzword and everything, but you gotta go back to the ground truth of what is important to you, and not just focus on the technology, but focus on what your risk tolerances are, focus on what your, those thresholds need to be and what type of actions you wanna take, and do a crawl, walk, run approach, right? Don't go implementing first day and start enforcing it. Understand, if I did this, if this happened, and if I did this, what does that look like? And then, of course, move towards implementation at that point. Yeah, so just for the audience, I've seen Jerry's approach to Zero Trust, and it is one of the most practical and uh, in-depth approaches that I've seen, um, especially in the private sector. So I think it's, that's, that's why we're talking right now, because I think it's, I think it's amazing. But I, you know, it makes me ask you the question, have you ever seen a zero trust deployment that meets the essence of zero trust ever? So given that you haven't, do you feel that this executive order mandated by the government is practical for agencies to adhere to in adopting zero trust? I think so, but I think there's still a lot of education of what it really means. I talk to a lot of people, a lot of people are still asking, where do I get started? Um, there are some definite things that we're being asked to do in the memo, um, but there's still a lot to do around zero trust. Um, so with that, you know, I, I think it's practical. I think it makes sense. When you look at the concepts, they're concepts that we've been talking about forever. Um, you know, privilege account management, um, least privilege, um, you know, data segmentation, network segmentation. These are all concepts, but what are we doing? We're not doing them in the silo. It's not just the identity management team. Go do your thing in your silo. Uh, the network team, go do your thing in your silo. Endpoint people, do your thing in your silo. No, this all has to work together because I have to have that telemetry from all these different factors to make decisions. And, and one of the other things is, 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 yeah, it's double is. One of the other things um, I, would, I would say and um, really quickly is, this is Jerry's opinion, is as a federal government, we've been very compliance focused, right? Because of FISMA and things like that. And we, what do we do is we categorize a system and system has a boundary. And based off the categorize that system is with the controls that we put in place. But one example I use is, okay, one control says I need to provide authentication. Okay, username and password. I was compliant. But I don't think one person, I hope, would raise their hand if I asked, was I effective? We all know username and passwords are not very effective. So there's a big difference between effectiveness and compliance. So I think we need to move, and I think that's kind of what the executive order is pushing us towards. I mean, the way it's titled kind of says it, right? Is we're, we gotta be more effective. Um, and I think that's where, you know, MI, AI, ML are gonna be very important in helping with that automation because we can't rely on humans. And I think that um, driving forward, how do we measure that effectiveness? Blue teams, purple teams, red teams, things like that. That's what we gotta get to measure. How do we better measure effectiveness at the end of the day? So moving away from cybersecurity as a checklist to actual practical effectiveness to help prevent against cyber attack. Yes. And do you feel that the approach that's been taken thus far or that's been mandated will result in better protection against cyber attacks for government agencies? Yes, um, one of the things I like to say is um, if you're an X-Files fan, of course, you know, trust yeah. no one. And you know, a lot of people talk about the insider threat. Well, 
you know, with a true zero trust environment, insider or outsider, I'm gonna proof you to who you are. I'm gonna, if, what telemetry do I have with the device you're using? If it's a BYOD device, all right, I might know model and iOS, and I can block you based off that. But, you know, um, I got limited telemetry, so my risk is a little, is a little more. But definitely, I think, you know, it's very important to understand that you gotta understand the factors and what's important to you and what, how you measure those factors. That methodology is, is very important, I think, than just deploying a bunch of tools. Hey, Jerry, it's, um, it, it's interesting to see where this quest for zero trust will take us. Yes. But I have no doubt that the consistency that you and others in the government are driving for to meet a zero trust strategy will help protect us against cyber attack. And so I just want to thank you for your time today. It is almost impossible to unpack a topic like zero trust in 20 minutes. I think you did a great job. So I want to thank you very much and for your efforts in helping protect us. Thank you. Thank you.